We're going to dive right into our first panel of the day. And here to introduce our panelists is our moderator, the Canadian Chamber's new Senior Vice President of Policy and Government Relations, Matthew Holmes. Matthew, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Catherine, and great to be here. I've I've got my coffee refilled and ready to go. So looking forward to a, a great morning panel here. This is the uh, food, fuel, and fertilizer panel. And so what I'll do is I'll introduce our each of our speakers and panelists today, and then uh, they'll they'll have a couple of introductory remarks, uh, positioning and uh, framing for us where they come to this uh, this this troika of of issues and 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 uh, Canadian commodities. And then from there we'll get into a, a discussion that I think will be quite quite engaging. So Canada has an abundance of the goods that the world wants and needs, including food, fuel, and fertilizer. And so this panel today will discuss the potential that we have to grow our economy and, uh, and, and, and build on what we already do well, I think, with the right set of investments and the right infrastructure in place. So I would like to now introduce the panelists. I'll go through them one at a time uh, and, and invite each of you to just say a few words to begin. So first we have Jasmine Ignesky. She's the Vice President, Policy, Sustainability and Government Relations with Parkland Corporation. In her role, she oversees Parkland's advocacy activities, policy development and environmental and social governance functions across Canada, the United States and 23 countries throughout the Caribbean, and Central and South America. Jasmine. Thank you, and thank you very much for having me join you today. I'm quite excited to be part of this wonderful panel. Um, maybe I'll just give a couple quick remarks. Parkland, we're an Alberta-based company, uh, multinational with operations across 25 countries and a presence across every province in Canada. Um, we serve 1 million customers today and a day and what we're really focused on is providing our customers and communities with reliable fuels, quality fuel, quality foods and convenience items. Um, we're really committed to being a leader in producing greener fuels. We're working on low carbon fuel production, EVs, solar energy, and really focused on meeting the needs of our lower carbon world. I really do believe Canada has a big crucial role to play domestically and internationally when it comes to fuel supply and we really see a huge significant opportunity in the energy transition and are very excited to be a part of it. Great thank you Jasmine and great to have you here today. Our next panelist is Karen Proud, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Fertilizer Canada. Prior to joining Fertilizer Canada, Proud was the Chief Operating Officer of Food, Health, and Consumer Products of Canada. And so I think you'll see uh, she brings a wealth of experience here relevant to today's discussion, both on the, on the fertilizer side, but also with uh, quite a depth of experience on uh, food as well. So Karen, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matthew, and and a big thanks to the to the chamber for putting this on. It's it's so important and so timely uh, right now that we're talking about sort of these three areas. Um, folks in in my line of work or or in the fertilizer sector uh, often say that outside of the agricultural sector, nobody really thinks about fertilizer until there's not enough. And unfortunately, we're in that situation now where the world is looking at fertilizer and, and specifically looking to, to Canada as a, a real dependable source of that fertilizer. So I am thrilled to, to be on this panel uh, today and, and really look forward to, uh, to the discussion. Well, great to have you here and thanks and welcome, Karen. So our last panelist this morning is Peter Zada. Uh, Peter is the Vice President Operations and Supply Chain at the Port of Vancouver and is responsible for the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority's land and marine operations, health, safety and security and port and supply chain optimization activities. Peter. Great, thanks uh, and good morning everyone. Uh, thanks to the Chamber, Matthew, for, the, uh, for uh, allowing the port to join the conversation uh, this morning. To provide a little bit of perspective, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority is a federal agency mandated to enable trade through Canada's largest port, the Port of Vancouver, uh, while protecting the environment and considering uh, the impact on communities, those latter two groups, of course, being uh, much more uh, higher in our considerations than they might have been decades ago. Uh, as the largest port uh, in, in the country, Canada is responsible, sorry, Port of Vancouver is responsible for $1.03 of uh, international trade beyond uh, North America. 
Um, we have been on a long-term growth trajectory in the Port of Vancouver, and uh, today's or this morning's focus on food, fuel, and fertilizer. This trade cluster is growing at about 70% faster than other trade volumes that we're experiencing through the port. So really important issue for us to be discussing, a tremendous opportunity, and one that we're taking very seriously at the, at the Port of Vancouver. So I look forward to the conversation. Great. Thanks, Peter. And thank you all. So welcome. Uh, again, this is the Food, Fuel and Fertilizer panel at Canada 360, and we're, we're keen to get things started. The, the conversation this morning between uh, Nick and Stephen really engaging lots of interesting insights there, um, particularly around how Canadians are feeling right now. Uh, there's, I, I don't think I need to say that it's been an interesting few years. Uh, and, and now we're moving out of, uh, you know, a focus on the immediacy of, of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and what that meant for everybody in their business, but also in their personal lives. And now into, uh, you know, a, an economy and a geopolitical situation that seems to be uh, evolving and changing rapidly around us. So as we get into this panel, we're, we're going to be moving, I think, from that, that sentiment and what are the fundamentals of, uh, you know, the, um, the economy that we're seeing and, and the sentiment that we're trying to read from Canadians and looking at some of the trade uh, implications uh, as the three of you come to these uh, these important uh, core parts of our economy. So in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the geopolitical tensions I've mentioned, and, and of course, climate change, uh, all of these things are exposing significant vulnerabilities, I think, in the global trade infrastructure. It's the Canadian Chamber's uh, view that now is the time for a reset with a focus on the fundamentals of the economy. So this means investing in growth through domestic and foreign trade that creates jobs for Canadians and opportunities for our businesses. And I think that's also building on what we do well and what our trading partners need from us. And we've been seeing an interesting dynamic emerge around, you know, French shoring and, and what our trading partners are coming to us looking for. And the question is there, I think, do we have it and can we get it to them? And are there barriers to doing that? So what the question for the panel, and, and I'll, I'll ask Jasmine to start, what role does Canada have to play in meeting these increased needs for food, fuel, and fertilizer that we're seeing around the world right now? And, and I'll put a little, a little add on to that. Is this simply an economic imperative? Or, or do you see there being a broader opportunity for Canada to lead? And, and that question will be for all three of you, but Jasmine, if, if you'd like to start. Thanks. Thank you. Small question. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question. I think Canada has a crucial role to play, um, both domestically and internationally, um, especially when it comes to fuel supply. I think in all the areas we're talking about, um, but you know, you talked about the the war in Ukraine. And I think that conflict really has been felt globally and has a lot of ramifications. Um, and as an international partner, Canada has to assess the opportunities needed to support not only our domestic needs, but these international ones as well. Energy demands are increasing, not decreasing. The call for climate action and lower carbon fuels is increasing, not decreasing. So this energy transition that we're a part of, uh, in order to see not only our ability to support internationally, but domestically as well, we really need to see more research, more innovation um, in order to be able to procure more low carbon fuels. Um, you know, I think if you think about that fact that Canada also has, I think Canadian companies have a challenge meeting their own domestic needs, meeting the regulatory needs that they have as well, that yes, there's that opportunity globally as well, but I also think we have to balance that with how do we assess what we have to produce in Canada, and then how do we expand that to be able to export to our global partners? And then last but not least, I think the other thing we have to think about is we have to balance those needs as well through an availability and affordability lens, right? The impact of inflation, the increased cost of living Canadians have had and the world has had has really been top of mind. So how do we think about all those things um, and be able to support reliable, stable, affordable fuels? Great, thank you. Um, Karen, first thoughts. Yeah, uh, again, I, I agree. Canada has a tremendous role to play here. When it comes to, to fertilizer, 
maybe I'm a bit biased, but I would argue it is the most important product in the world. Um, without fertilizer, we cannot grow the amount of food we need on this planet to feed the, the population, period. And Canada plays a massive role in that. We export to over 75 countries. When you talk about like the big three fertilizers, there's many different fertilizers, but when you look at the big three fertilizers, we are number one in the world when it comes to potash. Our competitors are Russia and Belarus. Um, so if you're looking at a dependable supply uh, for potash, Canada, Canada is it. When it comes to nitrogen, uh, which is the, the big heavyweight um, fertilizer, um, Canada is number nine in um, production in the world. Number one is China. And so when you think about where you want to source your fertilizer products, uh, it can break down into a number of, of areas. One, Canada is the dependable source when you look at who else is out there in the world. Number two, uh, we are the sustainable source of that fertilizer when you look at who our competitors are. And, and so the focus really should be for Canada in growing our capacity and our ability to provide uh, these resources to the rest of, of the world uh, and expand upon uh, what we're, we're doing. And, and you asked, I think, a, a really important question, Matthew, as to whether or not this is just sort of purely economic. For fertilizer, this is humanitarian. Um, we look at the countries that have been impacted by uh, global events, by the war in, in Ukraine, but even before that, uh, with rising prices of natural gas and and um, and and the reliance on the industry to to use that to to produce fertilizer. I think Canada plays a, a huge role in ensuring that the countries that need fertilizer to be self-sustaining, especially those African countries, get the products that they need. And, and so um, a massive role for this country to play and a really good uh, story for Canada uh, when it comes to fertilizer. I, I opened sort of the remarks about, you know, people don't think about the fertilizer industry. Um, it is a, a really good news story uh, that I think this government needs to, to look at and, and grow and, and focus more. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'll ask Peter to, to weigh in and then we can have a bit of a back and forth. Yeah, pr probably jump in and, and echo much of what uh, what the previous uh, com comments have been from uh, from Karen and Jasmine. Um, as, as a port, obviously, we're, we're very focused on uh, kind of the supply chain dimension of this. Do we have the capacity to to continue to support the movement of these goods? But I think Karen's point is a really good one um, that these are kind of the have been and uh, and will continue to be a big part of the fabric of this country and the economic underpinning of our of our standard of living uh, and maintaining relevance internationally with respect to these commodities that are increasing in demand actually puts us in a position to be you know punch above our weight uh, as it relates to these human humanitarian and other uh, geopolitical conversations that are unfolding. Uh, Canada is important in these conversations because China needs our fertilizer or African nations need uh, our, our products. And so uh, it is it is absolutely about the economy in Canada and the standard of living, but uh, it does play large into the role that we play internationally. With respect to supply chain, the second part of the, the question is how does Canada you know, meet, meet this opportunity? It really is uh, kind of learning from the asterisk, uh, the, the highlighting of, of the vulnerability of our supply chain that we experienced through the pandemic and through the atmospheric uh, uh, and climate related impacts on, on uh, the Western supply chain in 2021. Uh, as a port, of course, we're involved in uh, delivering infrastructure at Tidewater. Increasingly, we are working on the network adjacent to uh, the port facilities. Uh, and then uh, as, as, uh, as Canada has undertaken a, a strategy to look at uh, infra uh, transportation uh, infrastructure, uh, optimization, digitization, and, and, and how, we can, how we can use the capacity that we have more fully uh, and build resilience into supply chains, because maybe Maintaining our presence internationally, as, as Karen has mentioned, is so important. We can't be in a market and then out of it. We've got to sustain our presence there so that we uh, uh, bring that uh, uh, stability uh, to, to, to Canada as a result. 
Great, thank you, Peter, and and thanks all for those those first thoughts. Um, so I heard some some interesting convergences emerge. I think uh, you know, uh, Jasmine spoke of being an international partner. Um, Karen raised and and I think challenged us to look at this as a humanitarian and not just an economic opportunity. And and Peter, you're 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 talking about how we maintain relevance and. Um, I think influence globally uh, to 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 you know bring a little bit more Canada to the world, and so given that I th I think we're all leaning towards um, the need to export, um, and that there's there's a real need that goes beyond just uh, the the bottom line for Canadian businesses, but but let's drill into that a little bit further. Um, what what are some of those, and, and Peter, you alluded to these, what are some of the barriers or um, uh, dynamics that are challenging us in exporting uh, and, and being able to deliver more uh, of these things that the, the world so desperately needs and that we have in such abundance? We're, we're quite fortunate in that way, as, as uh, Karen uh, clearly articulated with those, with those reserves and uh, what we have with fertilizer. Um, what what do we need from government and and that's that's a two-sided question i think because we need certain barriers reduced um, but we may also need some policy measures uh or or support in other ways so peter maybe i can ask you to start and then we'll go to karen and jasmine yeah, thanks uh Matthew. I, and I made reference to this in my uh, in my previous comments uh, you know we we continue to advocate for a national uh, transportation strategy i think that's one of the one of the key underpinnings i i, I often uh, uh, kind of dumb it down to a simple statement of uh, of the value proposition of dealing with canada and that is buy our stuff we'll get it to you uh, and that's been uh, that's been uh, uh, something that was bankable uh, for for many many years and i think some of the volatility that we've experienced in in recent years uh, has has given rise to the question about um, about whether that's possible i think we need to restore that confidence things like a national transportation strategy can help real dollars uh, and support for uh, infrastructure that's necessary for that to happen whether that's at the plant uh, in the prairies or at uh, at tidewater i think are other things that canada can do to to accelerate uh, restoring and uh, and putting an asterisk behind that uh, that response and then finally, uh, and, and you probably hear this from others, uh, you know, the response time for making a decision, uh, permitting approvals, et cetera, uh, you know, Canada as a, a small-ish economy amongst uh, those major trading partners needs to be responsive. And I think uh, there's uh, lots of examples that we can cite where uh, things have taken perhaps longer than anyone would like uh, in, in terms of seizing the opportunity to, to, to get that investment in the ground, so to speak, uh, would, uh, would be things to turn our attention to 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 make uh, to make the point that we're in this business, uh, whatever it is, uh, internationally for the long term. Great, uh, Karen, thoughts? Yeah, um, Peter makes some some great points, and I and I think that's really key is is um, transportation and our supply chains uh, and how we get our products um, to to the ports and and. Um, it's one of the things that Fertilizer Canada has been uh, very supportive of, which are the recommendations around from the National Supply Chain Task Force that the government pulled together. And so, you know, the government really does need to move on uh, both short and long term initiatives to shore up our infrastructure in order for us to get our products to where they need to go in order to to get um to the countries where where we're trading, I think if we're going to continue to be a dependable uh, source of supply, our supply chains also have to be uh, dependable sources. But the other thing we need is uh, investment in the growth of our sector. So I'll talk about obviously the the fertilizer sector. We supply twelve percent of the world's fertilizer. Why isn't that twenty percent? Um, well, the reason it's not is we don't produce enough here um, in order to, to be that, uh, that size of supply. And that's because we're not driving the investment into our, our, um, our companies who, who make these products. Uh, we see what the U.S. has done 
uh, with its uh, recent legislation. That's a game changer for where investment is going to go. And I think if Canada really wants to deliver on increased demand, it needs to prioritize those sectors, including the fertilizer sector, for driving investment and really looking at what are those barriers to investment, sitting down with the global CEOs to find out, you know, if we build it, will you come? And um, those conversations haven't yet happened. And I think um, there is a, a great opportunity for the government in light of everything that's gone on in the last few years to prioritize those sectors where we need to drive investment and, and maybe we have to look at them a little differently um, when it comes to some of these cross-cutting, overreaching policies and, and, and tailoring the approach in order to drive the investments that we need. Thanks, Karen. So just uh, just before we move to Jasmine, uh, when you speak of the U.S. And, and the recent investments and that focus there, you're you're alluding to the Inflation Reduction Act, I, I'm assuming, and that that emphasis and shift towards more industrial policy and a focus on uh, critical minerals and other uh, other key assets. Is that correct? Absolutely. And and when I talk to my uh, my members, what I hear about the the difference in the the two approaches, Canada versus the United States, is uh, the United States is is the carrot. Uh, trying to provide incentives for investment and and um, and pumping money into into investment and supporting those industries and Canada right now is the stick uh, which is doing trying to drive change through regulation and taxation and otherwise um, and and the carrot approach as as we probably all know is is likely the one that is going to drive the the level of investment we need if we want to grow these these sectors and and really position Canada certainly in in fertilizer really position uh Canada as as a heavyweight uh in this industry around the world right thank you so so Jasmine, over to you uh, with the with the uh, the theme still of what do we need from the government? What are some of the fundamentals that you you see in your line of business? That's a great question. I agree with both what Peter and Karen said. I think we definitely need more support around infrastructure uh, to grow the fuel sector. And Karen's point about the U.S. I mean, the North American fuel market is fully integrated, so we're competing with U.S. companies for investment. Uh, and supply of biofuels, low carbon fuels, feedstocks. Um, so for us to meet the demand and be able to scale up, we certainly need more support from the government. I don't think it's a one size fits all approach. I think it's really about what's the right way to de-risk innovation. So I think there needs to be more investment of dollars. There needs to be some changes to the regulatory environment and more incentivizing policies. You know, that comment Karen made about stick versus uh, carrot, I think, that's really important. And I think that rather than focus on only one alternative, I really think it has to be a bit of a menu of what is the right thing for the right sector? What is the right incentive? Because um, they're not all the same. And I think, you know, for us to be able to scale up low carbon fuels for the needs of the not only Canada, but the world, I think we need to see a lot more of that. You know, I'll talk about Parkland as an example. So we have a refinery in Burnaby and we supply a quarter of BC's transportation fuel, 30% of Vancouver's jet fuel. And we're co-processing fuel right now where we're taking conventional crude and co-processing it with low carbon feedstocks like tallow um, and canola. And what's coming out is one eighth the carbon intensity of conventional fuel. So we're really trying to be a leader with low carbon fuel production, but to scale that up in a way that the country and the world needs it um, I really think we need to see um, more in terms of uh, de-risking uh, this innovation. If I could, Matthew, if I could just jump in, I love Jasmine what you said about you know what is the right approach for the right sector, and I think that's what's been missing uh, in a lot of government policy is it's kind of this one size fits all. You know, you're you're manufacturing or you're mining, and it, and here's the the policy that applies to your sector. But it's it's not looking at um, the differences within that. So our potash mining is very different than than other mining, and what it needs to grow and thrive is very different, or or could be very different. The same with our 
our nitrogen uh, manufacturing for, for fertilizer, where we use natural gas as a feedstock, so we convert it into a very valuable product. That's a very different way of using natural gas than other similar sort of manufacturing uh, sectors um, do. And I think it's that really looking at the sectors individually and how do we um, grow those and what policies do they need as opposed to this one size fits all that that would be a fantastic uh, start if we could if we could get to that. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. So, so I'm hearing here then both of you have raised the idea of uh, scaling up. Uh, Karen, you posed the question, why aren't we 20 percent? Uh, and and Jasmine, you you raised those those challenges of really exciting uh, you know climate transition economy movement on the fuels that you're putting out into the marketplace, but that need to scale up, that need to have the economy of scale to actually make the change that we're we're aiming for. So this is a classic Canadian issue. Um, before we move on to some of the other questions we've been thinking about, um, just a quick kind of scale up. You know, lightning round from all of you. What are what are some of the barriers to where you're sitting in your business uh, and in your sector right now to that that scale up question? Uh, Peter, maybe I'll ask you to start. I, uh, you know, again, as an organization, we're very focused on capacity and so infrastructure, uh, infrastructure funding, recapitalizing those programs like the National Trade Corridor Fund, uh, maybe leveraging up in targeted industries, a greater proportion of federal contribution being made available, because uh, it's it, it's fundamental to our ability to access markets, but it also goes hand in hand with net zero objectives in terms of reducing impacts on, on those communities that host uh, transportation uh, transportation activity, and I would say unlocking unlocking the opportunity for investment in Canada through uh, a, you know a, a, a more timely review process, not necessarily less stringent because of uh, all of the uh, all of the challenges that we face with respect to investment, but getting getting to yes, frankly or no sooner, I think is 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 a key refrain that we should be uh, um, uh, uh, messaging to government. That's a great point. The getting to yes or to no sooner. So, and Jasmine, that that brings up uh, a point that you made around de-risking. So, quick quick thought again on scale up. Yeah, I think definitely um, more support around federal government investment uh, into the fuel sector. I think the challenges for us are also we're competing with U.S. companies with U.S. investment. So, I think you know a more robust response to the U.S. IRA, I think it's something that we really need to see in order to move ahead. I mean, we've talked about our plans to build a renewable diesel facility in B.C. and potentially making that sustainable aviation fuel capable. But without being able to have more support on the investment side uh, and more investment parity with what the U.S. is doing, I think that will be a challenge. And then last but not, not least, I'll also say um, some support on the policy front. You know, how do we help de-risk um, the market? I think the government and companies maybe are there, but if the market demand is not yet there for these low carbon fuels, how do we balance that out as well? Great, and Karen, any quick thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, I absolutely agree with what uh, what Jasmine has said about um, about sort of de-risking, and and it reminds me of something that one of my members uh, speaks about, which is this strike of pen risk that we seem to face in Canada, where almost overnight, a government decision can suddenly change the ROI on your investment. Um, and we don't have that level of predictability that we need because these investments are not about, you know, next year or the year after. They're many years out and there's millions and millions, if not billions of dollars of investment. And we can't um, drive that kind of investment if we don't have the predictability where, you know, you've got carbon tax prices changing or you've got a government policy that comes out that suddenly changes um, the the direction. Um, so that that de-risking, I think, is is absolutely key. Um, but we do have, and, and as Jasmine mentioned as well, um, we've got our neighbors to the south that are really pulling that investment out of out of Canada right now because of the approach that they're taking uh, to these to these sectors. And we have to find a way if we want to grow these industries in Canada, we have to find a way to to match that or 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 drive the investment back, um, or or we're going to risk losing out. Great points, thank you all. So. 
Next question, uh, we're going to move into the hypothetical space. So this this can always be uh, pretty pretty interesting. But before we do that, I just want to remind the uh, the audience today. Uh, we're we're really excited to have uh, such a such a great number of people across the country joining us. There is a, a Q and A session about to begin, so we'll we'll be moving into open format Q and A in a few moments. And uh, you can you can enter your questions on Slido.com using the hashtag capital C A N can 360. So Karen, maybe I'll ask you to begin on this this final round of uh, prepared questions or or kind of thematics that we've been discussing lately together. Um, what happens if Canada misses these opportunities? And and how can we how can we lead? How can we avoid those missed opportunities? And I think for you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to frame your answer, but you mentioned Russia and Belarus earlier. You mentioned China. Uh, obviously, there's there's uh, an incredible uh, question mark and shift happening right now within geopolitical supply chain dynamics and international trade. What happens if Canada misses the opportunity from the fertilizer perspective? Well, that's a great that's a great question. Um, and as you mentioned, and as I said at the at the beginning, look at who what other countries are in this space and who are our competitors. We have China, we have Russia, and we have Belarus. Um, the world depends on on fertilizer. If you're not if you're not able to manufacturing it yourself, or if you're not blessed having a natural resource such as, such as potash, you are dependent on these countries that that produce it. And and if Canada misses the boat, I would say, and not to be overly dramatic, but the world suffers because they need this is not a, an option. You need fertilizer in order to grow. Uh, the amount of food that the world needs um, in order to feed the, the growing population. Uh, if Canada doesn't step up, well, the U.S. will, uh, and is, in fact, and, and is driving uh, investment and, and production there. And, and so from a purely economic standpoint for Canada, uh, we are going to miss an opportunity to grow this uh, this sector that is already a powerhouse uh, in this country. And, and I think um, for Canada, you know, we pride ourselves maybe more so than than a lot of other countries around the world in really uh, not only having a strong agricultural sector in this country, but supplying part of the world's uh, food supply for being uh, that country that um, is dependable, that does want to support other economies, that um, does want to to provide um, the sort of resources that we have right around the world. And I, I think um, there's no reason why we should miss this opportunity. It's really about the government recognizing what it has in, in this country and, and the good news story it already is and just had a how to push it forward. Um, I think it's it's a matter of, of the government looking at, specifically for fertilizer, looking at this sector and say, what is our fertilizer strategy moving forward? How do we go from 12% of the world supply to 20% or to 30%? Of, you know, maybe that's unrealistic, um, but really developing a strategy now to see where we want to position ourselves in the future because I don't think that the countries that are currently playing um, leadership roles are ones that we want to rely on uh, for the future. And, and we do need to, to shift. And I think uh, there's a great opportunity here and, and, and the environment is ripe for us to, to step up and fill that even more. Great, thank you. Um, and, and at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, we're, we're hearing uh, frequently from our members, uh, this this concern that there's a piecemeal approach uh, and and that we lack some of these critical strategies. Peter, you mentioned a couple of uh, of these in, in your remarks earlier: the national transportation strategy and taking a trade corridor approach. So, can I ask you to just weigh in on the, you know, what happens if we miss the opportunity with with those uh, two pieces in mind? 
Well, yeah, and I, I would echo the need for that, uh, you know, not a piecemeal approach. Uh, the national transportation strategy seems to me to be a, a key element. We're, we're pleased to see the government is, uh, is moving forward on that. I think that goes hand in hand with, uh, you know, kind of thinking about the industrial sectors that we're trying to promote and uh, and sustain going forward. So whether that manifests in an industrial strategy of some type, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, many of these challenges are ones that are uh, are kind of in in stream already, in the sense that we've had a lot of success moving products through many ports in in, in Canada, uh, a significant amount through Vancouver, and we're experiencing the challenges of highly utilized supply chains that have perhaps uh, not had the degree of investment that they need, uh, and emerging issues around the density of of, uh, of uh, utilization of land in major metropolitan areas like like Vancouver, driving up the price. And uh, and creating uh, adjacency challenges with communities that are that are close to rail lines, close to close to terminals. So uh, conversely, uh, you know, seizing that opportunity as Karen and Jasmine has have, have outlined. Uh, leads to investment in supply chains, well-functioning supply chains that perhaps have greater resilience than than they might otherwise, causing less uh, less disruption in in terms of our international trade uh, position, but also not creating the challenges in those communities that host this activity that we, we might otherwise. So, investing in infrastructure. Bringing a greater level of sophistication to supply chain management through things like the national transportation strategy, we think, is important as well. Could we anticipate? Things like uh, climate events more more effectively further in advance. Could we uh, see things like the uh, the ever the ever given in the Suez Canal and the knock on effect that might have on the West Coast and take more proactive steps earlier in a disruption like that? And I think most importantly, in terms of what uh, what where there's both a leadership opportunity and what do we have to lose? I come back to the net zero and and uh, ambitions around. Climate, uh, reducing the climate intensity of, of these industrial activities, they come through investment. They come through a step change in the technology that's being deployed to mine or process or refine. That's how we actually achieve uh, and align both of those interests, creating and maintaining our position internationally and having best in class uh, investment happening in these facilities so that we're, that we're uh, reducing the intensity on the environment. Thanks. Great, great points, Peter. Thank you. And interested in in uh, something you raised there about the adjacency and you know the communities uh, where a lot of this production and the supply chains are are taking place or moving through. And Jasmine, I think Parkland has a really interesting perspective on that. You're 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 very consumer facing, whether it's you know picking up some food for dinner or filling up the tank on the way or, or charging the vehicle on the way to getting home. So, um, quick thought on um, before we move to questions from the audience. Uh, what happens if we miss this opportunity and, and what are you seeing from from the unique position that parkland brings yeah I think that's an interesting question both from the domestic and international lens i think you know it, we certainly are very consumer facing both with our retail stations i mean our refineries and you know burnaby which is a block and a half from a residential neighborhood so we really are focused on our customers and our uh, consumers and making sure that we're acting in a very responsible way. And I think that speaks to, you know, a lot of what Karen said as well too. I mean, if you think about, if we can't export our fuel, our fuel products, fertilizer, food, then countries are gonna be forced to rely on those that are doing it less responsibly and less sustainably. Um, and I think that is gonna be a, a challenge globally. It has the potential to not only reduce energy security, energy and food poverty, uh, it could even go so far as to destabilize nations. So I think, there really is a huge opportunity for us here. And I believe that right now we're at a tipping point. I think that we're either gonna be in the game or we're gonna watch from the sidelines. And I think if you think about it as well from a domestic perspective, Canadian jobs, government revenues, our GDP, a lot of this is gonna potentially suffer if we don't get the right solutions in place. I think in the short term, you know, we have a huge risk of brain drain. I think industry, leaders, people are going to start moving to other jurisdictions that maybe are offering the right incentives or the right opportunities um, to be able to make the right long-term investment decisions um, and create the right you know, balance of profit and uh, security from, from the sector. I really do think that if we miss this opportunity now to be able to export our products, you know, for all three of us who are on the panel today, 
I think we're not only missing an opportunity to benefit Canada, Canadian economy, but our global allies and our global environment. I think it's not too, I, I think we really need to focus on the fact that we are doing things in a more sustainable, um, low carbon way in Canada. And that, that leadership, I think from all, all key sectors, I think is something that is really needed on the global stage. Great, thank you. And so, so I'm going to move us into the the Q and A uh, session here. We have about four minutes, five minutes left. Um, so there's actually a, a question that's been that's been raised, Jasmine, um, that builds off of that last point you made. And and so uh, we have a question: How does ESG factor into investment and policy decisions? Um, so maybe, and, and just in the interest of time, because I have a couple of other questions here I'd like to get to, can I just ask everybody, uh, open, open session here, who'd, who'd like to jump in on that one on ESG? I'd be happy to. Thanks. Um, I think that is a really great question. I think ESG really permeates all sides of our business right now. It's something that really is baked into our company strategy. I think you have to think about it in terms of, you know, our base business, where we're growing, what are our customers looking for, what are investors looking for, um, even governments. I mean, if, if you know we're a company that's trying to increase our production of low carbon fuels, we know we need to partner with government for that. We know we need to have the support of our investors. We know we need to have the support of our local uh, communities and indigenous communities. So I think without being able to take real action on not just the E, but the E, S, and the G, um, I don't think that you're going to get the ability to really drive the changes um, in the sector and drive the low carbon fuel production, which is really what we're focused on. So I think if you're not thinking about it from every side of your business, um, you're not going to be able to, I think, move ahead uh, in the ways that we need to um, in order to be able to um, create more of that uh, fuel supply in a sustainable way. Great. Thanks. Maybe I'll ask Peter if, if he has any thoughts, because we have a, a question for Karen as well. So you can kind of close yeah, no, the I, session. I, I, I would just absolutely echo what uh, what Karen has mentioned. As you can imagine, as a federal organization, we're, we're seized with, uh, you know, uh, um, executing a government mandate. But um, I'll maybe mention just as an example, we have a very large project that's going through the final what we think are the final permitting stages to, to build a some more container capacity in Vancouver. Uh, all dimensions of that project have uh, have uh, been kind of fully em fully embraced from an ESG perspective, and we have 27 or so First Nations that are kind of principally uh, those that we're consulting with, and we have agreements with 25 of them. So uh, the point I wanted to make is maybe reiterating what, what I said previously. It's through the investment that uh, Karen's members or Jasmine can make that we can seize the mantle of demonstrating how Canada can do these things. I think that's what uh, that's what we're doing at the Port of Vancouver. I'm very proud of the work that we're doing with First Nations and uh, and 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 others uh, around our community. Great, thank you. And we we really only have about a minute, minute and a half left. So, Karen, there's been a couple of questions that have come up for you specifically. So, you're welcome to to weigh in on the ESG question. But first, I just want to also raise. Um, we've had one question around uh, the the Russia. A Ukraine conflict and is Canada in a position to pick up the slack is one question and then a related question is what would it take to get to 20 percent from 12 so you raised that that dynamic earlier um so ESG or this 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 scaling up of fertilizer for Canada yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll speak to the to the question regarding the Russia Ukraine because that's been I think top of mind. Uh, I get asked all the time about um, about the the gap and 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 is Canada in a position? Um, we can't just flip a switch and make more fertilizer, um, especially in our our mining facilities. We have to scale up over time. When the um, conflict uh, started in in Ukraine. Um, our members made commitments across the board into increasing the fertilizer production and capacity in order to try and and help, but also having to to keep an eye on this is a a conflict, hopefully um, short lived, and and so we have to to balance our production um, forecasts and capacities with the the idea that this will be short lived. 
We do know uh, now that um, Russia has managed to get a lot of its fertilizer uh, out the door, not uh, not into into Canada, but other countries. And so the gap that was anticipated at the beginning um, is maybe not the size it was uh, now. Uh, we, we did get a lot of fertilizer onto the market. Um, but that brings us back to the question as to who is the dependable source of fertilizer and, and who's right. going to be. Uh, in the long term, and and so how do we get Canada from from twelve to to twenty percent of the world's uh, supply? It's really uh, sitting down with government and developing that sector specific fertilizer strategy for Canada. If that is our goal, I don't know that that is. I just threw that number out there, uh, right. Matthew. But if our goal is to increase um, Canada's role on the world stage when it comes to to fertilizer, then we need to sit with government and and really address. Uh, the barriers specific to the fertilizer sector. And I would very much welcome uh, that conversation with the government. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I need to to uh, end the session here. Uh, it's been a really dynamic conversation. Thank you, Karen, Peter, and Jasmine for your contributions and insights. I'm sure the audience uh, really benefited and found a lot to, to take away. Um, before we move to our second panel of the morning, we're going to take another quick 10 minute break. Uh, thank you again. And, and we'll see everyone hopefully at 1135 uh, for the panel, The Demographic Crunch and Workforce Innovation, moderated by Bianca Barti with the Financial Post. So please stick around, some great conversations to, to follow. And thanks once more for joining us at Food, Fuel and Fertilizers.